Hello shooting riders and anyone else with a passing interest in turning an enduro bike into a Tet adventure bike. This film is all about my KTM 450 EXC. If you're just interested in the kind of the, the nuts and bolts of what I've done to this bike, um, I'll put some stuff on my website, follow the links in the description, um, and yeah, you can be done dusted in 30 seconds. I'm more interested in telling the story of the bike, and that's going to take a little bit longer. So um, yeah, stick with me. So this is a 2013 KTM 450 EXC. Uh, it's an enduro bike. Um, it's a street legal enduro bike here in the UK. You buy it ready to go on the road, so it has um, headlight, number plates, all the rest of it. An enduro bike is really for racing, so it's completely constructed around the idea of racing on dirt. So I bought this in 2013, um, which on the one hand seems like yesterday, and on the other hand seems like a lifetime ago when I think about where I was at in 2013. Um, I guess to take one step back before that, what bike did I have before this? Well, uh, in 1998, I moved to London to study, and then I started a business down there and started earning a little bit of money and I bought myself, uh, well, my first, well, I had a scooter to start off with and then I had a, um, a Suzuki SV650S, the kind of curvy one. And then I got a, kind of before the whole hipster thing really kicked off, this one must have been in about 2008, something like that, I got a Triumph Scrambler and customized that a little bit and that was my kind of you know I've always been interested in dirt bikes and that was my dirt bike but I was literally riding around Shoreditch and Hoxton and Hackney on my kind of faux fake uh, dirt bike but it was great and anyone that's got one of those bikes it's um, it was one of the carburetor models so before fuel injection kicked in and it just sounds amazing <laughs> with the arrow exhaust and that it's absolutely epic um, and I used that bike to get out and around, but I, I never rode it on dirt and I kind of didn't have any experience of riding on, on dirt at that point. It was all just about roads. Um, and then in 2012, uh, my wife and I moved up to Northumberland and it was a bit of a, well, it was a career break and it was also a real change in lifestyle. Um, I left my media company and I started retraining as a furniture maker um, and I was using the bike to get you know from our house our new house up in Northumberland to to work and back um, and I started seeing these guys I was kind of riding through Hexham and I was seeing these guys like on plastic plastic bikes covered in dirt and I was like damn that looks like fun where have they been and um and then I started researching it and then you start learning about green laning and the thing is with um, if you want to start green laning it's you can't really there's nowhere to like hire a bike and have a go you kind of just got to jump in and buy the bike so I remember very clearly being over um, I was at my in-laws for the weekend and I took myself off to the rocket center in uh, Blackburn and I was just kind of getting out for the day and I walked in and, and they had all the, the brand new KTM enduro bikes lined up and I was just like wow <laughs> I can't get one of these and I was remortgaging a house at the time so I kind of borrowed a few extra thousand pounds um, in order to finance the purchase and I literally I don't know if I put a deposit down there and then but I I, I either did it then or, or I phoned the next day and just put my deposit and I said yeah I want one of these and I was like I had no experience of riding dirt and I did a real um I did what many many road riders do the bike that I had was a 900cc, so you go, okay, well, what's the biggest dirt bike you can get? You know, 450, 500, you know, I uh, don't want a 125, don't want a 250, they're for like learners, you know, come on, I want a, a proper man's bike. So um, that's what I did, I went in for the, the 450. I, absolutely, I knew absolutely nothing about it. And I remember kind of going over and, um, and picking it up and at that point, I'd never even sat on, on an enduro bike. And uh, I don't know what the salesman must have thought of me. Um, and I hired a van to go and collect it. And I remember even just like walking it into the van, I was like, oh my God, this thing is huge. 
Um, and I'm not a big guy, I'm five foot seven, and I'd, I'd literally at that point never even swung my leg over it. And I remember kind of it strapped down in the back of the van and I was like driving home with it and I was thinking, this, what have I done? Like, I bought like a thoroughbred horse, it's, this thing's gonna kill me. <laughs> and I was pretty terrified of it to start off with. And we, um, we were living on a farm at that point, not farming, but just living there. So fortunately I had a bit of land to kind of practice on. And I just remember like that first, first year of ownership was literally learning how to fall off this bike. And I fell off the bike an awful lot. I've got my laptop here to uh, go through some old photos to remind me. Um, and I kind of figured that that's the best way to kind of talk through the story of this bike and tell you a little bit how I changed it from that stock OEM ready to race raw bike to what I feel is a bit more of a tamed down, adventurized version of that bike. Okay, so yeah, so this picture, this was, uh, at that stage, I'd, I'd bought it on the credit card, so I needed to sell my Scrambler, my Triumph Scrambler, to, to pay off the credit card to pay for the new bike. And so, it's so hard saying goodbye to like old bikes, isn't it? I, you know, I was really sad to let that Scrambler go, but um, I had to do it. I didn't have enough money to kind of have two, two bikes at that point. Um, so yeah, that's a two, the 2013 model in orange, fresh plastics, not a single scratch on her. Um, really didn't stay looking like that for very long. Um, but yeah, a proper, proper race bike, really. So this picture makes me smile because, well, it's my wife sat on the bike, but really, um, I knew so little about, <laughs> about KTMs at that point that I actually sat that up and, and got Georgia to sit on it. And if I, if, if I knew then what I know now, I would never have put any weight on that standard KTM side stand, which, is made of cheese. I'm surprised it lasted uh, as long as it did with the Georgia sat on it there because they just snapped. So yeah, that's one of the first things that I changed after the first time that thing snapped and the bike went over. So I'd moved up to Northumberland and I uh, didn't really know anyone up here. And I, although I'm from the region, I've not lived up here for a long time. So the bike was really a, a means of exploring, exploring this new place that I'd moved to and making new friends. Um, and this was one of the first events that I took part in. I think I'd had 10 hours on it and I entered the Kielder K2 rally up uh, in Kielder. Um, and through that, I met some really, 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 you know, lifelong friends. Kind of makes me cringe now to look at that bike in that setting. Um, it's a race bike and yeah, the K2 is kind of a, a rally race kind of thing, but it, it just so doesn't look like it belongs in the countryside at all. And I can understand why people have issues going look at these bikes. You know, it's, just, it's just parked up there um, next to a tent and it already looks like it's going fast and it's not even moving. So uh, yeah, now I look back at it, I can kind of really understand why I started to change the way the bike looks. And a lot of that is about like D, de-racing it, if that makes sense. So one of the sections in the K2 was actually going through some of the enduro loops and I remember getting uh, stuck in there. <laughs> like, I had to get rescued. I couldn't get the bike out myself um, and some of the, the marshals came and rescued me. So uh, yeah, thank you for that. Me and Joe, Joe was um, one, of, uh, one of the guys that I was racing. So things that I've kind of noticed that have changed on that bike already at that point were the addition of, um, uh, metal uh, handguards. So I think anyone that's new to the trail riding, that's probably something that you, one of the first things you're going to do. A lot of the bikes come with plastic handguards and the, uh, the OEM KTM ones don't even wrap around. Um, they're kind of open at the end. So it doesn't take long for you to drop that on something hard to break a lever and quickly you, you realize that you need to beef up the uh, protection there. So yeah, that's got, other than that, I don't think there's much new at that point. Like I said, I'd only had it for about 10 hours. So one of the key things with this bike was exploring the area. And when you, when you start green laning, um, trail riding, what you are actually on is the start of a land access journey, but you have no idea. Um, you just want to ride your bike. And if you want to ride your bike legally, 
you realize that you, you can't just kind of go, oh, okay, there's a trail, I'll go up there, or, you know, I'll ride through that farmer's field or whatever, because, you know, that's all private land and you just can't do it. And the next step is actually trying to learn where you can and can't ride. So I <clears throat> joined the TRF, the Trail Riders Fellowship, which is an organization here in the UK, which exists to preserve, uh, well, conserve green roads, um, which is another way of, call, of, of saying trails. And um, they essentially kind of fight legal battles to help keep those trails open because there's not that many of them left here in the UK. Um, but the, the legal classification of those roads is um, steeped in history. And they go back to essentially what might look like a, a, just a, a muddy track will at some point in history have been a road um, for a horse and cart or whatever, but it is legally classed as a road. So yeah, um, I joined the TRF and I started going out riding with the, the guys in the TRF. And yeah, I mean, I just remember like, like this fight was me like riding across a river. And I just remember various points in that early ownership of just pinching myself that I was, I was in the picture in the magazine that I'd always kind of dreamt of being part of. And, and here I am doing it. Um, and yeah, I was absolutely in my element, absolutely loving it. So not, not only are you on a journey of learning about where you can and can't go, one of the other aspects of, of owning one of these bikes is you become, you're on a journey of learning how to spanner and wrench and become a mechanic because it's true what they say, these bikes do need a lot of maintenance. Um, and that's not necessarily because of the bike themselves. It's not like the bike falls apart on its own <laughs> or is poorly made or, or, or whatever. In fact, it's quite the opposite, but you, you're gonna give this bike a lot of grief and a lot of abuse and you're kind of gonna, gonna give it a bit of a hard life. Um, but the great thing with these EXCs is everything is designed to be really, really quickly and easily accessible. So. You know, in this picture, this is me starting to kind of learn about checking the valves. Um, you're going to change the oil every 15 hours. And I kind of did that religiously for the first kind of three or four years. And 15 hours, I mean, so if you're out trail riding for eight hours, that's probably about five engine hours because you're going to, you don't take into account the times that you stop and kill the engine, waiting, having lunch, all the rest of it. So it's, you're probably going to do an oil change and filter change every three rides if you're sticking to the, the, the manual. Now, you kind of learn that the, that 15 hour service limit is very much kind of geared towards people that are using this bike as it was intended, which is racing. Um, so over time, I extended that to every 30 hours. But I, I really religious, I've got my, um, kind of uh, I printed out the service schedule uh, on many, many pages, and then you can kind of just log your hours and tick down all of the checks that you need to do. And you kind of, you, you quickly figure out what stuff is, yeah, that's gonna be fine, and what stuff you need to pay attention to. So, yeah, so this is, you know, literally the first time I'd ever done some real proper spannering on a bike. Um, and if you were gonna go and pay to have your bike serviced all the time, my God, it would be an expensive hobby. So um, yeah, yeah, learning how to do it myself was a key part of, of, of having this bike. The funny thing on here that I can see is it's got the um, tax disc. Remember tax discs? <laughs> Before everything went digital, tax disc, disc sellotape to the, um, the front fork. And this is one of the kind of, um, early photos of my um, radiator and the radiator on my bike now does not look like this <laughs> it's got a dent in it um, and that was after doing a, an enduro kind of practice day um, it didn't damage the bike at all I mean it's worked fine I've not changed it but I did after that put some radiator braces on uh, because essentially you put the bike on the side quite a lot and the radiator takes a lot of the weight of that and so it is quite vulnerable even with the plastics that surround it. So yeah, putting some kind of protection around your rads is, is always a good idea. Um, other than that, nothing else new other than the, the DIY um, insulating tape race numbers from the Keele K2. Okay. <laughs>
<laughs> so this is Stephen uh, with his bike upended in um, Slade Forest. There used to be a, a, a trail that went straight through the forest that got very muddy and very, very wet. And um, I, had, at that point, started um, taking other people out because I kind of started to learn where to go. And it, the other thing is you never really want to go trail riding on your own because you don't know what's going to happen. And it's, it's kind of a safety thing and a friendship thing. So, yeah, um, I pretty, I think I remember this was on the way back, on the way home, and Stephen had kind of dropped his bike in and it had drowned it. And I was like, mate, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I've kind of seen, uh, you know, on YouTube what to do, um, but I didn't really know. So this is us appending it and seeing if we can get the water out of the um, the exhaust. And then, um, yeah, I don't think, I think we got it going this time, but um, yeah, just the idea that you can drown a vehicle and within a matter of minutes get it going again is just mind-blowing like I love it about these bikes they're, they're so robust um, and once you know how to fix a drowned bike it kind of takes the fear away of doing river crossings and all the rest of it yeah you don't really want to drown it but you know that if you do you can get going again so this is Rich in um, Slaley coming up the Heather's like really beautiful I do I kind of cringe a little bit looking at these old photos this is you know must have been 2014, you know, this is like quite a few years ago now. Um, and the reason I cringe is because you can look at this photo and it looks like you're using the countryside as a racetrack. And that's largely down to the way the bike looks and the clothes that, you know, we're choosing to wear. Um, and it's not necessarily the reality. Some people do that. But for me, it's not about charging around the countryside as fast as you can. So this is a life skill if you are into off-road motorcycling um, and there's life before you knew how to do this and life after <laughs> and that's changing a tire and changing a tire on the trail you know and, um, I don't run mooses I haven't ever run mooses um, mooses well if you don't know what they are go look them up um, I run um, inner tubes just standard inner tubes and Getting a puncture on the trail is it's kind of standard, you know. You don't really want to do it, but it'll happen at some point. And so you need to know how to change it. So you need to know how to use your tools, your tyre irons, tyre levers. Um, and it can be a team effort. And, and those early days of going out, it really was a team effort. And kind of when things go wrong, that's the things that you remember. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and this particular bit is... Um, it's always the worst bit <laughs> is getting the the tire on at the very end and trying not to pinch your tube um, and yeah doing everything you can not to pinch the tube because that's an absolute nightmare because you've got to take it off and redo it. You still with me? You're still going? This is quite long. I'm probably going to have to cut a lot of this stuff out. Um, this is more memories for me than it is for you I think just reminiscing kind of happy times. I, I think one of the other reasons why I'm kind of so emotional about this is like these these photos, like, they represent a time in my life where I had a huge amount of freedom. Um, I started trail riding in my kind of early 30s, and uh, I was married up in Northumberland. I had lots of time. I didn't have any children. Um, I didn't have a huge amount of money, but it didn't really matter because I had the bike. didn't really need anything else. And I was out exploring, and, um, and it's like a, a period in time that, that doesn't exist for me anymore. I'm kind of in my 40s now, I've got two kids, and just the ability, I'm looking at this like, this is like to go out and have eight hours on the bike every other weekend, maybe every weekend for a month, and, and, and it was no drama, it was just so easy to do. Um, and now, the idea of having eight hours on the bike uh, once a month is like a privilege, let alone more than that. So. Uh, yeah, look back on this with a lot of fond, fond memories. It was a good time. It was a free time. So this is, this is kind of the, the start of the real kind of customization of this bike. Um, I was working as a, a furniture maker. And so for the first time in, in my working life, I was kind of really using my hands to make things. Whereas previously, all my making was done 
on the computer digitally uh, with a camera. Um, so I was kind of really getting into like the tactile nature of, of, of using your hands to make stuff. And so I wanted to kind of add luggage to this um, bike. So I started kind of instead of, it would have been very easy to go out and, and pay the money for all like the, the Krieger um, rack loops and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I was, you know, not earning a huge amount making furniture or learning how to make furniture. So it was very much about what could I do with the things I had around me. So I think this was an old belt actually that I cut up to make these, um, these loops. So the inappropriate bike challenge, that was like a massive deal for me. Um, so I only had the one bike and I uh, decided to see if I could ride it from where I was in Newcastle to London and back. Um, and there's a number of challenges with that. One, the bike is not really, it's a race bike. It's not really designed for long distance journeys like that. It's not very comfortable, um, needs servicing, all that kind of stuff. It's really designed for off-road and that journey would require a lot of road. Um, and the other aspect of it is finding the routes to, to travel. Now, I would much rather invest my time with the camera and editing films and all the rest of it than planning GPS routes. It's just not something I'm particularly interested in. Um, so to make this film, and I'll, I'll show you a little clip of it, I decided to rely, and this is like early days of social media, but basically rely on the community, uh, the trail riding community to see if they could guide me all the way around the country. So I set off from Newcastle and I used Facebook to say, I'm here, I would like to get to there. Is anyone around that can help guide me? And it really was quite an adventure. And that film kind of really was the start of, of where I am now, really. Um, it got noticed. It, it was in a film festival in, in New York, in Brooklyn, I went to the Motorcycle Film Festival. Um, and it started kind of to help me realise that there was space to create media in, in this area. So it was really the start of bringing kind of two things that I really enjoyed together, this idea of storytelling and, um, and the bike, really. Um, so, so this is not my EXC. This is a Montessa um, 315. <laughs> I can't even remember. Yeah, it was my friend Clive. Well, actually, Clive was one of the guys that I met way back at the K2, killed the K2, and then um, he helped guide me on the first leg of, of the trip, um, the, um, uh, the coast, the the Green Lane Relay trip. Um, and he had this in his garage and I'd, I'd noticed it and then I bought it off him. Uh, really, I bought the Montessa to help Georgia and my wife learn how to ride a motorbike. Um, and on the day that we went to pick it up, she said, I think I'm pregnant. And she was. Um, and so this, I kind of included this this picture because again, it was a start of a another chapter in my life, kind of becoming a dad. Um, I didn't realise it at that point. I knew things were going to change. I didn't realise how much they were going to change. Um, but yeah, this was, I guess in some ways, it was the start of a new chapter and the start of the end of, of, of an older chapter. Um, but yeah, this was things starting to change. Um, and I'm not going to kind of talk too much about the Montessa here, um, but the reason I bought this bike was kind of this idea, this idea of kind of, doing another journey on the bike and, and what else could you do on these dirt bikes that was a bit unusual, a bit quirky. Um, and so I decided to ride the Montessa from uh, Newcastle to uh, the west coast of England, kind of coast to coast along with my friend Noel. Um, and that's another film, another story, another film festival. Um, but yeah, that was a, yeah, that was a great, great trip, great adventure, yeah. Reminisce. I need to do more of that. So back to the the KTM. So um, I guess at this point I decided that I wanted to kind of refresh the plastics, refresh the look of the bike. Um, it's so quick and easy to change the bike. So I um, I, I didn't have a big tank at this point, did I? So yeah. So I I just bought some fresh plastics, and I, again I didn't really want to go to the expense of of buying new. Um, stickers and all the rest of it and I kind of wanted a toned down look for that bike so this is literally just duct tape um, 
a ruler and a, a, a knife and seeing what I could do with straight lines uh, on, on the plastics. Um, oh gosh, I even went to the effort of, like that 450 writing there is hand cut out of duct tape. Gosh, I really must have had a lot of time on my hands back then. I don't think I would do that again. <laughs> oh, this was a fun one. Kind of doing uh, what ended up being absolute. There's a, there's a route up in North Northumberland that has like 28 river crossings. And this is Davy, um, good friend Davy. And uh, he loves a river crossing. So much so that we made him go first on this one. <laughs> and look at, the, look at his bike. He's got the same bike as me, a 450. I mean, yeah, totally submerged. I mean, you've not got the engine running at that point. You kind of figure, oh, well, we'll just, we'll just get it across without the engine going and, and it won't suck in any water. Um, but yeah, uh, Davey went across and then uh, he came back and uh, I think Mark was with us as well and we helped each other get the other bikes across. But yeah, that was epic. And again, you know, you, you drain the water out of the other end, hit the start button and they go. It's actually fantastic. Um, you just got to make sure you change the oil at the end of the day, um, and yeah, job was a good one. So this is in the spirit of uh, quirky journeys. So um, there's some trails that you can ride up in the borders, um, which are um, actually over on the Scottish border, which are, are actually legal, um, and Davy knows where they are. And so we went up um, and did a day up there. It was absolutely stunning weather. It was beautiful, and the theme of that that particular project, that particular film, was about like making a, a cup of coffee up on the hills. So I strapped the um, oh, whatever you call these fancy old coffee maker things to the front because um, I didn't, literally didn't have room in my bag to put it in, and uh, away we went. Yeah, that's using those little leather tabs that I made on the front. Oh, I've noticed the the. Um, okay, so I've I've upgraded to the Cycra handguards at this point, so. Uh, they're kind of they're pretty good. They're pretty strong. Some of those older KTM aluminium um, wraparound guards I'd actually managed to break. These cycle ones are absolutely bombproof. And I've noticed as well I've got the the Krieger not Krieger sorry the Giant Loop. Um, is it Mojave? Yeah, on the back there, the small the small luggage on the back. So at this point I must have started working with um, Adventure Spec. And uh, this is gear that Adventure Specs sell, and I was starting to kind of put on the bike to test and make media about. So this is the start of real start that, of adventurizing that KTM 450 EXE. Um, this is me taking part in the Northumbria TRF Hadrian Adventure Weekend. And the, the main difference you can see here, the two things are, um, I've got a big tank on there. I think so it's a 15 litre tank and um, I've got that bag like strapped on the front. Um, I've obviously had a, a muddy day out because <laughs> everything's pretty filthy. Um, but yeah, so this is, this is kind of starting to think about how can I actually take this bike and transform it into something that is suitable for more long distance journeys. Um, and really the, the tank that does that. The, the, the tank for me has got a couple of features. A, it increases the fuel capacity obviously, which is great. B, um, it provides really good wraparound protection for the radiators. So when you go down on the side, you, you don't really, um, there's, there's no real way of damaging those radiators. Um, and also it, it changes the look of the bike. All of a sudden you've, you've removed all kind of the sharper kind of racier plastics and especially if they've got graphics on and it starts looking like it's something that is designed for long distance journeys um, which is yeah it's important for me so this is really the start of the tech build the tech chapter of this bike um, and this is starting to kind of think about how do i use this bike to not just explore my kind of local area but actually go further afield and by this point um, I'd got involved in the tech project um, through Adventure Spec, so I built the tech website, um, developed the tech brand, and, and launched the project. Really, um, we had no idea that it would be as successful as it has been when we started it. Um, I digress. The bike. So, 
as you can see, I've kind of stripped all the orange off it and replaced the plastics with white plastics. And I kind of feel at this point, it's starting to look much more like uh, what you'd expect an adventure bike to look like as opposed to a race bike. Um, this is me kind of testing out a luggage setup, uh, kind of traveling light and the whole light is right ethos is kind of quite important to me. Um, it's not a bike that, you know, it's not got a great big substantial subframe. It's not really a bike that's designed to kind of strap loads of luggage onto it. It's really, it's a light, nimble, powerful bike. And the more you put on it, the less light and nimble it becomes. So the idea is to kind of travel light. So this is me experimenting with kind of how light I can go on it. Um, a bit more duct tape on there, uh, the good old duct tape and the big AS logo. But yeah, what else has changed on here? So it's the plastics, it's the tank. Um, I've got a GPS, um, a Garmin 600 um, GPS mounted up front. Um, there's two lights, the Vision X Solstice lights that I've put either side. And that was really because I was using the, the front um, headlight mask area to strap um, luggage to. I had my drone in there, so I still needed lights either side of that. Um, yeah, not a lot else, to be honest. Stock exhaust. Um, yep, yep, I'd say the rest of it's pretty, pretty standard getting ready for the Tet trip um, where we went from um, Newcastle to uh, Amsterdam and then around through Netherlands, Belgium, France and back up through the UK. Watch the film if you want to find out how that went. Yeah, that's that to me, that's a great looking bike. That's a great looking adventure bike. So one of the key things that I changed from this photo to actually going on the trip was changing the wheels. Um, the wheels on this bike were starting to corrode on the inside. Um, and I don't know if that's because in the early days of changing the wheels, changing the tires, I used to use like washing powder, to washing liquid to get the, um, the tire back on. And I think that kind of probably didn't help putting that um, corrosive liquid in there. Anyway, I wanted to upgrade them. So I went to, um, I, I spoke to Lyndon Poskett who I'd worked with and he had a set of uh, some of his old rally wheels that he, he sold me. Um, and they were uh, XL 60s, I think, uh, A60s or something like that. So they're, they're much stronger um, rims. They got much beefier um, spokes and the rear has got a hub, um, a cush drive in the hub. Um, and the reason why you put a cush drive on is really to try and take some of the strain away from the drivetrain. Um, I'm not technical. You, you, <laughs> I'm not really the person to ask the exact technical way it works, but essentially you're, you're taking some of the strain out. It, the bike doesn't come with any, um, any cush drive in it because you want to translate that power from uh, your, your throttle to your back wheel as, as efficiently as possible if you're racing but I'm not racing. So really taking some of the strain out of the engine components and the drive train components yeah, was key for uh, longer journeys. So yeah, um, upgraded those wheels. So one of the key things that, that I learned on that trip was that you could do a long distance trip <clears throat> with the EXC, the 450 EXC. It was absolutely 100% capable. Um, what I also learned was that it was quite a sharp tool for the job. So riding around Northern Europe, the trails aren't particularly hard. And uh, there are bits in the UK where you'd be very glad to have a lightweight adventure bike, um, but there's also a lot of road work. Um, you know, at one point we got off the, um, the, uh, the train down, down south, the Channel Tunnel, and rode 150 miles up the motorway to get to the Peak District in, in one go. Um, and the bike will do it, it'll absolutely do it. Um, no drama at all. But it's, a, like I said, it's a very sharp tool for the job. I think if you were gonna be heading off to Romania or um, the stands or anywhere where you're kind of really getting off the beaten track and you're gonna be really kind of grateful for that power to weight ratio of the EXC, then fantastic. 
but I did realize, I did start to realize that, that for adventure riding, it was, a, it was quite overkill, you know? Um, and, and that was about the same time that I got the Honda CB500X um, and did a load of work on that with Rally Raid, kind of put the kit on. Um, and I was kind of starting to wonder, you know, maybe something a bit bigger, more comfortable, that's adventurized, would be enough, you know? Um, and I enjoyed that bike. I think it's an absolutely great looking bike. Um, but in some ways that went too much the other way. It, it, it really did feel like a road bike that had been made that was more capable for a bit of off-road, but the style of riding that I was doing, I was finding its limitations. Um, there's, a, there's a picture here of, uh, of my friend Ryan on my 450, towing me on the CB500 home because I'd burnt the clutch out on the CB. Um, and that kind of says something, that picture. Um, I think if you were mostly doing kind of gravel riding um, and nothing too technical, I think the CB500X is absolutely brilliant. But for anything kind of beyond that, um, it's, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it was a road bike. So, so kind of my hunt for this kind of perfect compromise was the unicorn hunt really, isn't it? It's like you, you're trying to find the, the one bike that can do it all. And it really, the whole point of a, the unicorn bike is, it, well, it doesn't exist. It's really about understanding where you make your compromises and what you're prepared to compromise on and what you're not prepared to compromise on. Um, so yeah, so a little bit more of an evolution of the, of the 450 here. We've got um, an early prototype of the uh, mini fairing, the Adventure Spec mini fairing. So this is something that I was really excited about. Um, it's a really simple device. I mean, prior to this, the only real way to kind of get a fairing up on the front, it was a DIY job where you kind of put something on the, the headlight mask that kind of stuck up or you went all out on like a, a rally road book tower carbon fiber jobby, which is, you know, hundreds, if not a thousand pound plus. Um, whereas the mini fairing is like a hundred quid, bolts on, um, provides the prote protection you need and gives you somewhere to put your GPX, GPS device. Um, I actually think it absolutely, especially from this angle, it absolutely transforms the look of that bike. Um, I think it makes it even more of a perfect, <laughs> Yeah, even more of an adventure, uh, adventure enduro bike, um, especially if kind of you don't need that the the vision over your front wheel. Um, yeah, uh, I was really really happy with the way the bike was looking at that point. Um, yes, yeah, is uh, riding it through the house that we're in now <laughs> while it was being built. Um, yeah, I mean look at that. That's such a good. That's such a well set up. 450, if I don't mind saying so myself, <laughs> it really is. Um, yeah, that looks like you could take it anywhere. And you, you really, really could. And everything was going really well until I decided, um, well, I decided to go and try out one of these Fantic Caballero Rally 500s, because on paper they look fantastic. You know, um, an off-road bike that kind of looks like a hipster bike that you could take a fantastic photo of and it'll look really cool, but you know, you could take it anywhere. Um, and you know, it didn't work out like I test rode it. And I think it, you know, it, again, it's a road bike that's meant to look a bit like an off-road bike, but it, it wasn't. But at the same time, there was an AJP PR7 there and I test rode that down at MHB motorcycles. Um, and that was the start of the next chapter. I was totally kind of blown away by that PR7. Um, I've not spent much time on 690s, um, and I know the PR7 and 690 are about the same, but all of a sudden I was like, this is a bike that can do 85% of what my 450 can do, but in a hell of a lot more comfort. Um, it's heavier, um, it's not geared quite the same. You wouldn't want to take it on as, as challenging terrain as the 450, but then you ask yourself, how often am I now taking that 450 on the difficult stuff? Um, and the PR7 just kind of is an absolute joy on the road as well. Um, so this is me starting to realize that maybe the PR7 is getting closer to being that kind of unicorn bike. 
Um, and it wasn't long after this that I kind of went away and figured out like how how can I get my hands on a PR7. Um, and the only way to do that was to, to let the CB500X go. And then the, the true kind of spirit of things, the, uh, the, the original graphics did not stay there very long on that PR7. Um, I did treat it to a bit more uh, than a duct tape job, but uh, yeah, again, it's, it's about simplifying the look of the bike, um, trying to make it look a little bit less racy. And in hindsight, I probably shouldn't have put the big number board seven on there because that does make it look a little bit racy, but yeah, just trying to kind of smooth it out a little bit. And so once the PR7 was in the garage, really, well, two things happened. Um, I had another kid. <laughs> um, and the 450 just was not getting used, you know. Um, I just not getting out as much as I was, like trail riding uh, on the weekends. Uh, a lot of my friends that I'd started trail riding also started families, so kind of that chapter had really closed. Um, but the things I was doing, I was riding more on the road to get to places. I guess what you'd call adventure riding more than, than trail riding. Um, and the PR7 was, for me becoming a really lightweight adventure bike um, that could happily do trails. Um, but, but yeah, I guess it is more in that adventure class than, than the trail class. Um, and the, the 450 was just not sitting there, you know. I'd done, done almost 500 hours on that 450, about 14,000 miles, um, but hardly any of those hours and miles are done in the last kind of year or two. And I was really just taking out every now and then just to kind of, you know, keep it ticking over. Um, every time I sit on it, every time I start it up, and it, the power, you feel the power, you just like put some massive grin on your face. And, you know, I've thought so many times about selling it. And every time you sit on it, I'm, I'm like, I cannot sell this bike. Um, but if I'm not going to sell it, what am I going to do with it? Because it's all set up for adventure riding. I've adventurized this, this enduro bike. It does it, there's, there's no point in having kind of two bikes doing the same thing in the garage. Um, and if I'm not going to sell it, what am I going to do with it? So, uh, so yeah, that's the start of the next chapter of this is really kind of, so I'm not really a big fan of, of just having stuff, um, especially stuff that's not really, not being used anymore and not doing what it's intended for. Um, and so really that 450 is on its last legs, not last legs as in like it's going to fall apart. It's definitely not. It's in absolutely great condition. It's a, it's a, it's a last chance saloon really for that bike. Um, and I'm kind of giving it one more chance to, to do something, um, do something for me really for kind of where I'm at in terms of, um, my, time and ability to ride right now which is not particularly huge so the chapter that it's in now is really it's, it's the hipster chapter it's the it's the, the the pretty photo chapter um and what i'm experimenting with really is can i take this kind of this incredible tool as in the 450 enduro bike which is like such a, an incredible tool and can i make it look good in photos um and when i when i say that is essentially can i kind of can i vintage can i kind of dktm that bike and make it look like a, a hipster bike but know that it will absolutely trash any of those other hipster bikes that are all look and no performance um because i know that this bike will perform so really so far it's just been all I've done is I've taken the, um, uh, the, the headlight mask off and I've taken the uh, Adventure Mini fairing off and I've replaced that with um, an Elba. Uh, it's a Cherbis, a Cerbis, someone is going to correct me on this um, headlight mask, uh, which is like a vintage style. And the light in there is absolutely atrocious, it's terrible, but I'm not going to be riding this at night. It'll pass an MOT fine. Um, but it looks cool. Um, and then when I showed that to my friend Noel, he kind of pointed out that the mud guard wasn't working. So again, I've swapped that out with a vintage style mud guard, which is dead easy. So that's a hundred quid basically to, to 
completely changed the look of that bike in the front end. Um, I got busy with my uh, duct tape again. Um, what can I do with just some straight lines? Don't know that I'm particularly happy with that yet, but you know, it's dead easy to kind of experiment with. Um, and the real challenge is the, the rear end. That's where things get complicated because the, the air box and the rear um, mudguard are all kind of molded together. They all kind of fit together on that KTM. Um, I would love to put something uh, more vintage on there, but I, you know, I just can't see how that's going to work without having to, um, yeah, really kind of change the subframe and all the rest of that. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I, I mean, to be honest, the easiest thing to do is just to throw on some luggage. <laughs> And then you can't really see what the back end looks like, and it's just about the front end. Um, but yeah, so that that is the the story of the 450 EXE, the KTM 450 EXE. Um, it's brought a huge amount of joy to my life. It's forged incredible friendships with people that I think I'll be friends with forever now. Um, can I get rid of it? I think I can, you know, um, if it's just going to sit in the garage, then what's the point? Um, if I had four grand in front of me, what would I do with it? Um, if I didn't have that bike, uh, I think I would buy something electric. I'd probably need more than four grand. <laughs> but for me, that's, that's where I think the next exciting chapter is. Um, and the interesting thing with that electric conversation is that it's not about big miles. Um, it's about starting to understand kind of what's in your locality that you can do 50 miles because, you know, that's kind of the range you've got. Um, and yeah, what, what does that electric bike look like? Is it an electric pedal bike, which you can do trails on? Is it an electric motorbike? I don't know, but um, that's where it's going. Unless, unless the 450 rekindles the fire. So uh, yeah, if you've watched this far, uh, I take my hat off to you uh, <laughs> because it's been such a personal journey to me and I don't know how interesting it is to you. Um, I will try and reward you with some more information about the, the build of, of the bike. Um, so you can actually go away and take some kind of useful information if you want to put it on your bike. Um, and I'll put that on my website and, and put a link in the, in the video description. But thank you. If you've watched this far and you like what you've seen, hit subscribe. Um, there's plenty more about the PR7 on my YouTube channel. Um, and if you like photography and motorcycles, take a look at Shoot and Ride, my little side project. But yeah, thank you for your time and I will see you soon.